join us in singing the Philippine National Anthem to be immediately followed by our praise. And I am Nico Oreiro. We are your hosts for today. Before anything else, allow me to acknowledge the presence of the following. Secretary of the Department of National Defense, Secretary Delfin and Lorenzana. PIVAO Administrator under Secretary Ernesto G. Carolina. PIVAO Deputy Administrator Raul D. Caballes. NHCP Chairperson Dr. Rene R. Escalante. NHCP Executive Director Restituto L. Aguilar, TVB Vice President Mr. Mike Villarreal, Mount Samat FTES Administrator Mr. Francis Initorio, Dr. Neil Marshall Santillan from the University of the Philippines, Dr. Jose Romel B. Hernandez from De La Salle University, Dr. Archie B. Rezos from the University of Santo Tomas, and Professor Marlon F. Agoyagoy, MC from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. We would also like to acknowledge the presence of our resource speakers from our previous episode. Thank you for being with us here today. Right now, we have about 45 participants here in Zoom. For those who are unable to pre-register, we are currently being broadcasted via Facebook Live on the official Facebook page of the Philippines. Veterans Affairs Office. And right now we have about 33 participants present in Facebook. 
before we officially begin the program, here are some reminders for all of us. In case there are lags, just stay on and wait for it to load again. Zoom attendees are on mute to avoid background noise. If you have questions, you may use the message box for our Zoom attendees or use the comment section on the Facebook live stream. After the webinar, the participants who, who registered in this webinar are encouraged to answer the evaluation form. The link will be sent to your email. Now, just a quick recap. In our last episode, which was held on May 21, we were joined by Dr. Augusto V. Diviana of the USC Department of History, who shared to us the issue of collaboration during the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. In today's episode, we will be joined by another well-known scholar in the field of history, anthropology and sociology. The University of San Carlos' very own Dr. Asset Ayazar Arbor Salas. He will be sharing to us his presentation on the history of Cebu during the Second World War in the Philippines. So without further ado, let us begin our program with an opening message to be given by PIVAO Administrator under Secretary Ernesto G. Carolina. A pleasant day to everyone. Before uh, anything else, allow me to express my gratitude to our partners the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, the Philippine Veterans Bank, the Tourism Infrastructure and Enterprise Zone Authority, Mount Samat Flagship Tourism Enterprise Zone, and the country's leading universities, the uh, University of the Philippines, the De La Salle University, uh, University of Santo Tomas, and uh, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines for uh, teaming up with us in the conduct of uh, the Kagitingan, the PIVAO Historical Webinar Series. This webinar uh, series was born out of uh, our desire to propagate historical awareness among Filipinos, especially the youth, and promote the values of uh, patriotism valor, and love of country, values that were embodied by our veterans during the war. Further, this endeavor seeks to enrich our uh, audience's knowledge about the Philippine military history and promote future uh, research, analysis, and publications about the events that transpired during the Second World War. I could not stress enough how much webinars such as this play an important role in developing our nation and our future leaders. By looking back on our rich and long military history and uh, revisiting the events that led to our uh, independence, we are gaining a deeper understanding of who we are as a people and the lessons that influence our actions and decisions. Reliving the stories of the war also gives us the chance to learn more about the struggles of our veterans and how they face death straight ahead amidst fear, showcasing their brand of valor in the name of our country's freedom. Further, the unity, gallantry, and patriotism they displayed during the war are the ideals that remain important to us to this day. They serve as inspiration to us as we face our uh, very own battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. The 10 webinar uh, episodes we have conducted from uh, February to this day presented many facets of uh, our history, the famous battles and the lesser known uh, encounters 
the Filipino heroes and the collaborators who betrayed our country and the struggles and the victories of our veterans were all highlighted in the PIVA Historical Webinar Series. Although we managed to tackle uh, varying points and different narratives, there is still a lot of important historical topics we have not yet covered. Hopefully, may this be not the last time that we come together to recount the stories of the past and be inspired by the tales and heroism of our veterans. It is my hope that what has been shared and learned from this webinar series will ignite in everyone the willingness to partner with us in perpetuating the story of uh, solidarity, heroism, and patriotism of our veterans. May the victories and sacrifices of our veterans also inspire us to remain courageous and united as we continue to weather an unprecedented global health crisis and strive to pre prevail as a nation. Before I end, I would like to thank the participants who joined us from the very first episode to this day. My sincere gratitude goes to those who made the webinar a success. I commend all of you for your efforts as we look forward to more opportunities where we can work together in propagating the heroic needs of our defenders and in safeguarding the freedom they have fought and died for. Again, I'm privileged to join you in today's closing ceremony of uh, the Kagitingan, the Pibaw Historical Webinar Series. Welcome and a blessed day to one and all. Thank you very much, Undersecretary Carolina, for your welcoming message. And while we extend our appreciation and gratitude to everyone for joining us all throughout this webinar, may we now have our partnering agencies for their special messages. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome NHTP Chairperson Dr. Rene R. Escalante, to be followed by Mr. Francis Initorio, the Administrator of Mount Samat. The Second World War remains as one of the darkest chapters, if not the darkest chapter of our nation's history. The atrocities and devastation we've experienced as a nation cannot be relegated to just a mere number here. But we have yet to see these lessons from war and the heroisms and valiant actions of our veterans penetrate public memory. Still, efforts are made to put the Second World War in general conversation on history and heritage, even as far as culture and the arts. In 2020, the nation commemorated the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II in the Philippines. In February 2021, Pibao Historical Webinar Series was launched to bring the stories of war to a wider audience, remembering and honoring our veterans, fallen heroes, and victims of atro atrocities who shed blood and given their lives all for freedom of our nation. In behalf of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, we are grateful for your support and continued participation to this series from beginning to the end, and we hope the lessons you have gained from the lectures would, would instill Philippine pride in you and in every nation. A pleasant day to you all.
to our partners and lead organizers of this Katipunan webinar series, the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and the Philippine Veterans Bank, as well as the educational institutions, academicians, and speakers, a pleasant day to all. It is my great pleasure and honor to know the past fruitful discussions that have advanced among the participants of the webinar series over the past three months. The participation of academicians and experts, as well as avid learners, has been extremely valuable. Your interest in the story of our country and how we can further utilize it to help in facing the challenges of nation building has become one of the foundations of these information seminars. The promotion of nationalism and patriotism is therefore at the heart of the series of discussions and learnings. During the opening of the Katipunan series last February 25, Pingpao Administrator Undersecretary Ernesto G. Carolina emphasized in his opening statement that he and all the organizers hope that through these webinars our youth will not only recount the stories of the past but also ignite in everyone a sense of willingness to partake in promoting the heroism of our veterans and instill in us the values of patriotism and selfless service. Also, I mentioned during my past messages, the Mount Samad Flagship Tourism Enterprise Zone, as one of the supporters and partners of Pinbao, is confident that these learning sessions help us visit and revisit our history of patriotism and valor and build and rebuild our love of country. I am happy to note that we have hundreds of Facebook viewers and participants in every session. At this closing instance, let me congratulate all of the participants, especially those who completed the webinar series. Your attendance made this event even more meaningful and successful. May these virtual seminars motivate all of you to explore more about our country, write research and studies, and share to others the importance of our history. To our partner institutions, the University of Santa Tomas, the University of the Philippines, De La Salle University, and the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, thank you for leading the discussions. We, the organizers, commend your commitment to this event. The organizers hope that this will not be the last educational campaign that we'll share with you. We hope to see you again in our next webinar projects. We have many educational activities in store for you, especially with the launching of the Patriotism and Valor Communication Campaign of the Mount Samad FDES. Again, Congratulations to everyone. Enjoy the last part of the 13 collective topics of the factual imagery of the Second World War in the Philippines. And just like my previous messages, let me read a valuable quote again from our national hero. The divine flame of thought is inextinguishable in the Filipino people and somehow or other, it will shine forth. Maraming salamat, mabuhay ang mga veterano, mabuhay ang Pilipinas, mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you very much, Chairman Escalante and Sir Francis Initorio for your wonderful messages. For the main part of our program, we are honored to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Jose Eliasar Margaret Salas. 
Dr. Jose Eliasar Arbertales, or Jobber, as he is known to friends, is the director of the University of San Carlos Museum, manager at, of the University of San Carlos Press, and head of the USC Communications Office. He is also a full professor at the USC Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and History, and manager, managing editor of the journal, journal Philippine Quarterly of Culture and Society. He holds a PhD in anthropology with an archaeology dissertation from the University of San Carlos on a sandwich program with the New Mexico State University in Massachusetts, New Mexico, USA. He obtained his MA in the Philippine Studies from the Asian Center, Yuki Dileman, in 1996. Jobber was also a German academic exchange scholar at the University of Bielefeld from 1997 to 1999, and an Asia Research Institute ASEAN graduate scholar at the National University of Singapore in 2006. He also trained in GIS and archaeology at the Laurentian University of Professional Education in the Netherlands in 2007 under a Dutch MHO grant. Dr. Bersales currently heads the National Committee on Museums of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts and sits in its Subcommission for Cultural Heritage. He is also the Cebu Provincial Consultant for Museum and Heritage Affairs and is a member of the Cebu Archdiocesan Commission for the Cultural Heritage of the Church and the Cebu City Cultural and Historical Affairs Commission. Jobbers has written or co-authored a number of books, including The War in Cebu, a finalist in the 2016 National Book Award, and Salapit, the Nomi Mastic Heritage of the Philippines, which won a platinum anvil and a gold anvil in the 50th Anvil Awards in 2014. He is currently writing a book on the archaeology of Cebu for the National Quincentennial Committee and the pre-war Japanese community in Cebu, under a Sumitomo Foundation grant. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jose Jobbers Eliazar R. Bersales. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, last of the series of webinars on the war. And I'd like to thank first before proceeding, I'd like to thank the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office for uh, hosting this uh, lecture series um, despite the pandemic. My presentation this afternoon is uh, about, of course, uh, Cebu, where I come from. Okay. Um, uh, so it's about the war as it happened in, in Cebu. Um, I'd like to talk about, well, the, pre the preparations before the war and then the eventual Japanese invasion and occupation, but the in between the guerrilla resistance and uh, the atrocities committed by the Japanese to lead and then eventually the liberation of Cebu and the Japanese retreat and surrender in Cebu, then the aftermath of the war. And I'd like to <clears throat> add one more because I'm into all of us are into heritage and remembering. Yeah, I'd like to, to look into what we have done to remember and then forget and, and what needs to be done now in terms of, of remembering again. Um, please note that all images, unless otherwise indicated, are from the US National Archives and Records Administration. <clears throat> so the prelude. Let's start with this image of uh, of Lahug Airfield and the uh, Cebu Country Club. And this is the Lahog, Lahog Airfield. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's, it's full of buildings now, so it's uh, hardly rec recognizable. Yeah, this is a Banila Road, I think, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, before the war actually happened, we know very well that there was a uh, very hasty uh, formation of the 
United States uh, Army forces in the Far East. Um, um, General MacArthur was uh, recalled and uh, asked by uh, President Quezon to start a defense force uh, in the Philippines when it was becoming very clear that uh, war was uh, in the horizon, war in the Pacific was in the horizon. For the Visayas and Mindanao, a Visayas and Mindanao force was initially uh, established had, with its headquarters at Fort San Pedro. And here's a photo, photo of uh, General William Sharp, who was appointed to head uh, the uh, USAFE VMF, you know, Visayas Mindanao, Visayan Mindanao Armed Force. Um, however, as the war clouds got uh, nearer and um, nearer, the VMF was, was split into two, a Mindanao force was created. General William Sharp moved to Mindanao and the, the, heading the Visayan force was um, General Bradford Chinoet, who was in Panay, was based in Panay, moved to Cebu uh, when, uh, to, when, when the Japanese uh, landed in, uh, in Lingayen. Oh. And uh, ensuing uh, defense of Bataan uh, happened. Um, for Cebu, under the Visaya Mindanao Force, a Cebu Brigade was formed, the, 100, uh, the 81st and 82nd the Infantry. Uh, Camp Lapulapo, which I showed earlier, was formed uh, just to the uh, west of uh, the fledgling Lahug Airdrome, you know, which Basically, was was just open grassy field uh, that, until it was developed uh, later by the Japanese when they arrived. <clears throat> there were hardly any planes uh, when the war began in in, in, in in the Philippines. No, at least for Cebu, because many of the planes that we, I'm sure you've learned from the previous lectures that many of the planes at Clark were sitting ducks. No, did not fly to meet the enemy for some reason. Uh, well, the whole airfield was was you know mapped and uh, and at least a, a, a strip a, a, a strip was was made, but there were there was hardly any hangars for airplanes. There were a few airplanes, of course. The Cebu Brigade was headed by Colonel. Irving Scudder, and I could talk about the personality problems between Chinuet and Scudder and all these people, but the other, this is not the subject of the of the, uh, the webinar. I would recommend that you read Bradford Chinuet's uh, Bellamy Park Memoirs because he he bears out how poorly the the Philippines prepared for war and his anger at the at the eccentricities of General William Sharp. And I think he, he had so much burden to unload in that book. How, how ill-prepared the Visayas force was and how badly uh, a bad organizer William Sharp was. So we assume that General Chinoet was, was of course the, the opposite. That's what happens when you write a memoir, you're able to bear out and attack others, but never yourself. Anyway, uh, so the, okay. So Pearl Harbor happened December 8, Philippine time, then hours later, a few hours uh, then before uh, the 10 hours later, the, the Japanese uh, from Formosa started attacking you know, the Clark Airfield and all the other airfields in Luzon. And then you eventually have the Japanese landing at Lingayen Gulf and uh, and the decision to defend Bataan. And uh, then eight, January 2, the Japanese enter Manila after it's been declared, it was declared an uh, open city. Something that did not happen, by the way, in Cebu. Well, uh, Bataan fell April 9, 1942. Um, but, and, and the following day, the Japanese invaded Cebu. But before that, the Japanese was, was constantly bombing 
certain facilities uh, uh, in Cebu that that were vital to its um, to its existence as a, as a stay a city that still had much freedom because of the battle going on raging in Bataan. So we thank for the four months between the Japanese landing at Lingayen Gulf in December and the uh, eventual Japanese invasion of Cebu, you have about four months of, of relative peace in that sense for Cebu. And you have to thank the defenders of Bataan for those four months because the Japanese were thinking that they could finish off the Philippines in three weeks got hold up, as we know in, in, in I'm sure in the previous webinars, uh, by the defenders of Bataan. And there were, there were also many Cebuano defenders of Bataan. So there were weekly bombings of the port and especially Shell Island, at least regularly. And, uh, and one oil refinery um, near Pier 1, near Fort San Pedro and uh, Plaza Independence, the Madrigal oil mill. A photo here of the, some of them, of the of the machinery that were destroyed uh, as the Japanese started bombing Cebu. You know? uh, but there were regular evacuation to the hills when this happened, and Cebu's food was running out until eventually a ship arrived from Australia that managed to provide uh, pro uh, food, you know, and managed to escape. Um, just in the nick of time as uh, uh, Japanese bombers uh, would start bombing the, the, the port area. No? <clears throat> Here are, uh, well, on the day before the, the bombing, uh, the invasion of Cebu, April 10, Yusafi forces led by um, Colonel Chick Parsons, who would later go back to the States and come back to do intelligence work on behalf of, the, of, the, of, of MacArthur, they started booby trapping bridges and then, and, and uh, of course the electric company, the coal uh, depot at Carbon, uh, near Carbon Market today. And unfortunately, when they started booby bombing all these bridges and all that, the winds changed direction instead of, of uh, the, in the direction of the south, which is barely unoccupied, no, no commercial businesses. The wind suddenly shifted to the Northeast and as a result, the entire commercial district of Cebu, Magallanes was, uh, was burned down. M many people think Colon is the oldest street in the, in the Philippines. And we in Cebu, I think of us in Cebu, San aside, think it would be Magallanes at least because because that would have been nearer the area where Humabo and Magellan live. Anyway, that's uh, beyond the discussion here. So the invasion of Cebu a day after happened, April 10, 1942. General Chinoweth, uh, when the invasion happened, moved, uh, days before the invasion happened, moved his headquarters to uh, Camp X, no, Visayas Force and Visayan Force headquarters to Camp X somewhere in the mountains of Toledo near what is today Carmen Copper or Atlas Mining, but uh, opposite in the other direction. No? Um, it's not been located yet, but uh, Camp X or Camp 10, uh, that's between Camp, Campo uh, Once and, and Campo Just uh, These camps, I think, were named after the, uh, the, the, the construction of, of the Talisay uh, Toledo Road, which traversed the, the Cordillera of Cebu between 1903 and 1909 or 1907. And there were construction camps along the way because there was a contest to, um, to who would be the first to arrive. I think at Camp X, the, the, the center of the, of the elongated island of Cebu. And I think this is where the area where uh, where Chino West establishes camp above the, the area of the Alisai Toledo Road. But of course, eventually when the Japanese, uh, when, uh, when Corregidor also fe fell on May 6, 1942, days later, um, General Bradford Chino West orders his men to surrender. Um, 
uh, together with himself. A day after, I think, the invasion of Cebu, uh, Justice Abad Santos was arrested in the mountains of Barangay Dakit in Barili. Was eventually uh, executed in uh, in Malabang, despite all the protestations of the Imperial Japanese uh, propaganda group. I think in Manila that it would not bode well for getting Filipinos to support the in the occupation, Japanese occupation. If he was killed, no, that was uh, even uh, even I think um, if you read the book, you realize that there were attempts. I think to save his life from even the commander who was asked to eventually to execute him. He was arrested, by the way, in Bar Barangay Dakit, Barili. There's a new monument set up by a group of masons who, for some reason, I don't know why, they put the marker at the border of Barili and uh, Karkar, but on the side of Karkar. And, uh, it's causing some problems now. It was inaugurated early this year or late last year without consultation with anyone. I think the district engineer was a member of the Masons and at this, as it happened, the district ends in Karkar, another district starts in Barili. So it probably decided to uh, put, uh, help put the, the erroneous marker. So I think Barili is going to protest the location of that marker. It's a beautiful marker. It looks down on a on the cliff, or what is called uh, money, uh, no, no, it's a cliff. It's more like a canyon that you look down on, and beautiful obelisk, but it's it's erroneous, and it, it, its location is exact. It's not the exact place, no, um, according to uh, history and and and, and the city, uh, Benipayo, who wrote this book knows this very well, the book that won the National Book Awards uh, two years ago. That uh, the Justice Abad Santos, who was the highest official left in the Philippines, was arrested uh, somewhere in Dakit, Barili, near the elementary school. And uh, so the, it's incumbent on the, on the municipality of Barili to set up a marker there to counter the, the huge obelisk and a viewing deck established by the Justice Abad Santos Masonic Lodge. I think it's, it's named after him. That's why they they put it, that they, they were the ones who funded it, but it's it's in the wrong location. And if they're listening, if they're watching this, they, I think they should at least change the marker. Don't say that on this spot, uh, Justice Santos was, was arrested. It doesn't bode well for, for for, for him, for him, for what he did, for his sacrifice to, to make such a, a glaring error, um, glaring error that will, that will uh, soon cause, I mean, teach the wrong kind of, of, you know, location to young people who take pictures there. Maybe you can just put there that along the way, he, this was along the road to where he was eventually arrested, but never claimed that he was arrested there. Oh, and here is an, I don't know if I can play this. Oops. Here is a, a Japanese propaganda. This is from NHK uh, of how Cebu looked like, Cebu City, when the Japanese arrived. No? They got so angry because they saw a, all the Japanese stores were burned together with Chinese stores on Magallanes Street by, uh, by the Yusafe inadvertently. No? <clears throat> So let's watch. <clears throat> so this is a this is one of the, the two regiments of, of Imperial Japanese Navy that uh, that are the regiments uh, uh, groups <clears throat> the regiments that arrived, uh, that, that invaded. <clears throat> so they're all heading to Cebu. So you see, this was released when Japan was still 
you know, at the height of its power. So I'm very proud of the of, of this event. You know. So here's the landing at Talisay, the same spot where the, the Americans would also land in, in the American division uh, three years later. Three years later, yeah. <coughs> So very young Japanese soldiers. Um, yeah, they found no stiff resistance in the same manner that the American division would also experience. And then you have these Japanese students uh, in, uh, the, in Labangon who were, who were imprisoned. I mean, this was a concentration camp. And so they, they uh, welcomed, of course, the, the Japanese arriving. <clears throat> For some strange reason, they already had flags with them when the Japanese arrived, I passed by, you know. It's, it's the day after this is a ceremony at Labangon where the Japanese concentration camp was uh, was was located. You know. yep. Here the Japanese civilians uh, attending an event the day after, I think, when they were also told that they would have to support the imperial Japanese occupation. Many of them would be conscripted as uh, Officers and as soldiers, but that's why there's this. Um, wait, that's why there's this story that the Japanese who own stores in Cebu were already officers to start with. Actually, I don't. I don't think that's the case. I mean, at least I think many of them were conscripted. Many of them resisted. If you read some of the memoirs that were published later, especially that of uh, Mizoguchi from Dabao, I think that he, he at first resisted being conscripted to, to, to join the Imperial Japanese Navy because they were civilians, they owned stores here. Uh, but they, they, there was a campaign that also would bring them to, to the headquarters and did not cooperate. So in a sense, it's not, yeah, you have, you have Cebuanos who suffered, but you also have a lot of these Japanese civilians that, that were conscripted. Eventually they would all die, but some of them were also, you know, very bad, very brutal. So this is now the entry to uh, Magallanes from uh, from the south side. So here's the gasoline station from Tabuan, I think. Or, yeah. Uh, Vision Theater. This is Vision Theater that still survives to this day. It's owned by a Chinese resident. And I don't know why the city government doesn't want to. Uh, well, it's COVID now, so it's, there's no more money left to, to expropriate this to, to restore it to its glory. It's very historic established in the 1920s. You see a Japanese complaining about the burning of, of a commercial area. Carbon is burned by the Yusape. And, uh, this building still exists to this day, by the way. That's Magallanes, occupied by the Japanese days later, but it's all burned down. No, it's, it's all burned, uh, burned already by, uh, by the Yusape. Japanese really got angry. Uh, at, at, at this turn of events, no, because you have to arrive and suddenly there's no more food, no no supplies, nothing like that. They they did not, they did not carry enough food supplies and they were expecting a lot of canned goods and all that. But of course, the use of them moved much of the of the provisions of, of cans and of food, you know, that brought in by the Anhui. I think it was the Anhui, the ship that arrived from Australia, and uh, one of two ships that arrived. And brought them to the to the to the mountains in Adlaon and another area, but the Japanese would eventually find them. These were food provisions that Japanese needed. Oh. Okay, so you've seen the photos and you've seen the video, and this is this is how uh, Cebu looked like as the Japanese approached approached the city. You know, it was burning. The Japanese, of course, were also also sending planes to bomb. Uh, as they invaded, thinking that there would be resistance. So in that sense, unlike Manila, Cebu was not declared an open city. And so even at the start of the Japanese occupation, Cebu was already, I mean, at least its commercial and district and its waterfront was already burnt out, was already suffering. And this building still survives to this day. So San Miguel Corporation at the corner when you enter to the South uh, Road properties. This is part of the Malacanang Sasubo, which will be turned into a, the National Museum Regional Office or branch, a regional museum. 
so that you can see in between. And then the Japanese immediately occupied Cebu. They occupied this building, which still exists today in downtown Cebu, very badly preserved. But it used to, it used to be, it was established when the, in October 1943, when the Republic of the Philippines was established, the Puppet Republic. The Japanese withdrew first, they occupied the Imperial, the Rizal Memorial Library as the Imperial Japanese Administration Headquarters. They preserved all the semblance of governance. No, they did not occupy the capital. They did not occupy the city hall, but they, they and they asked all the officials to come back, but they assigned spies, they assigned uh, uh, Japanese officers beside the mayor and the governor so that everything that he signed or he ordered would have to be reviewed first by the Japanese officer beside him. You know? <clears throat> but, uh, but, but they never occupied in that sense the halls of power or of civilian power. They instead occupy, occupied this building which still exists today. And in October 1943, when the, when the Republic was established, they transferred to the, uh, this building and create, as the consulate of Japan. Of course, later, when, after the liberation, the Americans, of course, poignant symbolism, occupied it as also the consulate of the United, I mean, the United States, which, which was actually occupied until the 1960s. No? So immediately in the Japanese occupation, Governor Abeliana, who in, 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 uh, initially uh, evacuated with the rest of the uh, government officials as the Japanese invaded, they evacuated, I think he evacuated to Badian. He was recalled. Um, his family was, I think, hostage. He was told that if he did not go back to the capital, there would be reprisals, there would be difficulties, blah, 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 and all that. So eventually, around uh, May, late May, Hilario Abeliana went down to uh, the capital. And uh, you have these important notices then that were issued by the excuse me, Imperial Japanese Administration uh, in his name requesting all Filipinos to cooperate. And to, you know, this was done all over the Philippines. The same statement was made you know, that all government officials must go back to their offices uh, on or before June 30, 1942. You know, and uh, if they fail to do so, they will be considered enemies and severely punished. And uh, you know, passes were issued, so you have an example for this. These are from the uh, uh, Vicente Rama, Senator Vicente Rama papers at Museo Subo. Here is an, this is the only war museum, I think, in Cebu, but probably in the whole of uh, the, the whole, in the whole of the Visayas, or there's one in, there's one in Negros. And, but this one is really uh, inside Museo Subo. No? And then you'll find, and, and all this is, important mementos of the war. One of those important things was that the Japanese practice, or samurai practice, uh, the Japanese practice of, um, of uh, organizing uh, neighborhood associations, hoko, I think they were called hoko. Um, uh, and then everyone there was responsible for everyone else. And if there's going to be a Japanese uh, soldier officer who would, be, uh, who would be killed or who would be attacked there, then of, Ten of the, the ten people of that that associate that that street or that uh, neighborhood association would be arrested and would be held liable, even if they had nothing to do with it. And you know many of these these events, no, where guerrillas would attack uh, Japanese soldiers in a certain town on a certain street, and the, the ones who would be arrested would be would be the the locals. So I don't understand why the Japanese did this, but uh, that's not the way. To, to, to get the Filipinos to support you. No? They, their mindset was just, was just too militaristic to, to, they really thought that they, they could bring in Japanese military uh, attitudes, the Japanese samurai culture you know, uh, to, to, to the Philippines that it would have just be accepted within a week or two of frightening everyone and the killing of a few people. The opposite, of course, uh, happened. But the Japanese did try to, 
to encourage cooperation no so they established pro by propaganda machinery the Visaya, the Cebu the Visaya Shinbon was established precisely to 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 propagandize to to you know create all kinds of stories that the Japanese were winning all over Southeast Asia and that the 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 the, the Asian co-prosperity sphere was going to be established and everyone would be, would be loving each other, caring for each other under the, and, and then producing and then progressing under the leadership of Japan, no? Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Well, it's, as it happens, the members of the propaganda group also were guerrillas. Many of them were supplying information, real information, because, you know, as it, they had their own radios and were listening to real reports from from uh, from San Francisco, California, where uh, uh, reports of what was going on were aired from time to time on radios every day. You know? Well, <clears throat> the Japanese early on saw the Lahug Airdrome would be a problem for defense if there was no other there was no other airfield, so they established actually. The um, an airfield, an airfield in Mactan. This would later become, of course, the the Mactan Cebu International Airport. So every time you land at the airport, always remember, used, it used to be a Japanese uh, airfield. You know? uh, here's uh, here's the airstrip. I think that and then these are the circumference of the streets around it. Now, of course, the Cebuanos did not take the Japanese occupation sitting down. Almost immediately after the Japanese uh, arrived and occupied Cebu, the guerrilla resistance started to grow, especially starting in the south in Indomanho, because the, the elongated character of Cebu with its, at the time, 49 towns, made for very difficult control by the Japanese. So with very few forces, I think less than 2,000 at the start, they could not occupy all 49 towns. No? At, 10, at, at, at 10 soldiers, eight uh, soldiers and maybe two officers per town, you'd already have 400, you already need 490. And at 2000, you, if there's a big city, you would of course occupy the city where you know the uh, guerrilla the resistance would be stronger there. No? So the concentration of Japanese forces was only within the city, and they established certain garrisons uh, on, on bigger towns like Karkar, and then on Argao, and then in the north, Danao, and then on the top, on the northernmost, Bogo. But in between, you'd have relative freedom where the guerrillas could establish, in the same manner that, that happened in Samar and Leyte, if you read uh, the Babcock Diaries, you know, uh, of, of the diary of that, uh, officer from the, the Bureau of Education that got stranded in, in late there. <clears throat> so the first guerrilla of resistance or headquarters was in Dumanhug, started by the Hosalems, a famous political family then. Um, and there was relative freedom there. They even celebrated the anniversary of the Philippine Commonwealth in 1942, November, 5th, November 15, 1942. You, you have all this documentation by the, by the, by the, by Barba, who was the head of the propaganda uh, arm of the guerrillas. No? The guerrillas were headed by Lieutenant General. It was a dual leadership by Lieutenant General, I mean, Lieutenant Engineer, Mining Engineer, James Cushing, and radio manager, manager of the KZ, KZRC, the only radio station before the war in Cebu, Harry, Feinstein, who took on the name Fenton. No? This was a very erratic leadership that they had. Fenton stayed in up north in Compostela. Uh, Cushing stayed in the city, but eventually went to, to Tabunan, where the headquarters up in the uplands of, of, of the city, just behind the city. Uh, that's where he would establish, but they would be communicating. Uh, they, they, are, they, they initially uh, shared power. He, uh, Cushing would take the uh, military side of leadership and Fenton would be on the civil administrative relations. But Fenton was a very erratic, eccentric, and very brutal fellow. No? 
even at the start of war, he knew that he would be wanted by the Japanese because he had this radio program, which was very fiercely anti-Japanese, attacking all the Japanese stores, which were established in Cebu and far better than Chinese and uh, Filipino, very few Filipino stores. So he knew that he would be arrested. So he immediately ran to the hills and, and, and joined and eventually decided to head the civil, the, the administrative affairs of the guerrilla resistance, you know, Cebu Area Command. Colonel Manuel Sugora would become the, the adjutant of Colonel Cushing at Tabunan, and he would later publish uh, two books about the guerrilla resistance and, and reach the ripe old age of 91 uh, and then passing away about, only about five years ago or four years ago. Fenton unfortunately used his position to uh, put on trial all his enemies that he made uh, before the war, you know, until it became it became an important issue among guerrillas that he was killing people left and right, and that every night he would be provided with with young women to sleep with him. You know. And so eventually he was he would be killed. He would be executed by uh, by a um, a second in command of Cushing when Cushing was in Negros to uh, to dialogue with uh, with uh, with Colonel Villamore who was sent by General MacArthur to establish uh, contacts and determine whether the Cebu area command was really worth recognizing because early on up till 19 uh, early 1944 if I'm not mistaken the Cebu area command did not have uh, rec uh, uh, recognition from General MacArthur. One for for various reasons. One communications was the problem, and because uh, it was very hard, really, to cross from one island to the next. And Colonel Fertig had a different view of the Cebu Area Command. No? Uh, Colonel Fertig, who made himself general in Mindanao of the Mindanao guerrilla group there, um, did not trust the uh, Cebu Area command at the start. So there was very bad propaganda that reached uh, MacArthur until Villamore was sent to, to ascertain the, the, the operations of the Cebu Area Command. During this period when Cushing was in Negros to rendezvous with Villamore, I think, yeah, uh, in this somewhere in the, sometime in December and early January, Fenton was executed by his assistant, Ricardo, I forgot his name. He would also be executed because apparently he was working with the Japanese. It would be proven that the Japanese had sent him money to liquidate uh, the leaders of the guerrilla force. No? Okay. So this is, this is Tabunan. You can see the view of Tabunan looking towards Talisay and Cebu City. No? So it's, it's well placed to establish a guerrilla base, but it's defensible enough because it's really high up in the mountains of, of Cebu City, where so many expensive houses are built right now, no, without titles because there's, it's a, it's a national park. So it's, uh, and then it's a protected area. So I think as in the fringes, there are houses and they're not, they're just given uh, stewardship contracts for 25 years. So many resorts, mountain resorts there right now, and it's very sad that so very very few people every day who go there do not understand or do not know that uh, how important this part of Cebu City is to their to their freedoms, to the freedoms they enjoy today. Uh, the guerrillas also, of course, created a counter propaganda force, uh, the, headed by Barba, and they had a, a printing press run on a water mill in Barili, southwestern Cebu, on, uh, on top of, a, uh, on, on, beside a, a river where they, what, that would run the generator that would power the production of morning times. No? And so it's a map of the guerrilla movements in central Cebu around 1944. This is in the central area. It was clear that the Japanese, this is from Japanese sources, no? uh, 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 that were confiscated, I mean, found by the American division. It was clear that the, the Japanese had so many spies within the guerrilla group. 
So they give you as these are their headquarters, Kashi and Tabunan, together with J, um, Abel Albenda. Major Abel Trazo was in Akosar and in Dumanhog and later moved to Ronda. The Spirito was uh, somewhere around uh, the mountains of Naga and uh, Campex, no? uh, south, somewhere in Karkar. Then Major Hale somewhere in Compostela, replacing uh, Fenton. In between, you have Japanese atrocities committed in so many areas, arrests of respected guerrillas, tortures, and then they were their deaths. Not necessarily in Cebu City, but they'd be brought in garrisons. For example, there was a garrison in Domanhog, and you have the wife of Mariano Negiso pointing to his remains that were excavated at the back of the municipal hall, which became the garrison of the of the, of the small guerrilla of a Japanese force there. They brought some of the most brutal, one of the most brutal uh, atrocities of the Japanese happened in, in Barili at the garrison of the elementary school where so many families were brought, they were raped, the women were raped, the men were bayoneted, and there was a compost pit at the back. And I think I think uh, 22 victims could be here, heard. Every night people in the neighborhood could hear them asking for help as they were dying of these bayonets on, on, on top of others who are already dead. No, it, it must have been very harrowing to hear them crying out for help as they were bayoneted. All because um, uh, the Kausin, Colonel Jose Kausin, led a guerrilla attack somewhere near Barili. And all the, his relatives and all the others around his house were arrested and tortured and then killed. And so here you find skeletons of those that were later excavated at the back of this school building, which still exists to this day. And I don't know if people still remember this. And then the, another atrocity was the massacre of Chinese and Filipino uh, evacuees of Medellin uh, on, in October 1944 at the co crossing of Corva. And the most famous, I think, that people at least in Dap Dap Camote, Spilar Camote, still remember, is the massacre of all the residents except for one or two survivors. One survivor, I think, because he happened to be bringing Carabao off to to the farm or something you know, up in the hills and he survived the massacre. And these are Americans coming into the church where all these residents were told by the Japanese to come to <clears throat> to the to the uh, church because they would be giving out rations. Actually the reason why the Japanese did this was remember in October, October 22, 1944, the Japanese had already landed in and the Americans had already landed in Tacloban, and the Japanese started retreating by December out of Leyte. And well, if you retreat to Cebu, because there was an order to move, to transfer to Cebu and move, eventually uh, be shipped to, to Luzon, where the final resistance would happen by the Japanese. Many of these boats, they would be on sailboats, the Japanese would be on sailboats, and they had run out of, of ships, no? sunk already in the Battle of Leyte Gulf and the ensuing uh, battles in, in, in Leyte, on Leyte or off Leyte. So they would dock first in, in Pilar, the nearest from Ormok, and they, they would be, of course, killed by the, by the, by the, Pilar, the people of Cabotes. And so the, on that pretext, on that, on that pretext of, of, of revenge, a force from Cebu was sent to Cabotes and they pinpointed to another area, Esperanza and this one, that's where they would massacre all these residents so that anyone evacuating from Leyte would not be killed. And so you have these American forces recovering their, their faces you know, after they discovered the massacre. Eventually, however, the, the liberation of Cebu would happen in, on March 26, 1944. <clears throat> you have uh, the 132nd, 180, uh, March 26, 1945. 132nd, 182nd, and later the 164th IRs of the American Division, the only division that did not carry a number at that time. It was formed in uh, North Caledon and in, in Caledonia. No? Um, and so that's why it carries the Northern, the, I think the, the symbol of the Southern Cross no? in, in Southern Caledonia, I think. And uh, it's a combination of American and Caledonia, so American Division. 
which was formed uh, in and then the Japanese on the other hand was led by these uh, people so Sako Suzuki who died on the way to Surigao head of the 35th army that defended Visayas and Mindanao including Tacloban and later <clears throat> Uh, and the first division headed by uh, General Tadasu Katauka, who came in from Manchuria around January 1940, 40, oh no, March 1945, three weeks before the, the eventual American landings at Talisai. Then you have Shinpei Fukui, who was already in Cebu City, headed the 102nd Division, where, uh, preparing the city for the defense of the Japanese around January. And then you have the guard force, headed by Rear Admiral Kaku Harada. All three of them, all, all these, uh, uh, Katauka, Fuke, and Harada would survive the war. Sasako would, Suzuki would not. So on September 12, 1944, the Americans started bombing the William, Admiral William Halsey's bomber started testing the, the, the defense of the Japanese in Mindanao and Cebu and the Visayas. And they discovered that Cebu was, and the Visayas, even Mindanao was barely defended. The Japanese were expecting an invasion somewhere else. You know? So you have a start of US bombing raids. Of course, one of those that immediately suffered was the Correo de San Carlos building, which was destroyed on 12 September 1944, because there were two anti-aircraft guns right behind the campus. You know? the, uh, there was a, uh, the Japanese uh, armaments <coughs> were, were were kept at the building, uh, at the basement. So automatic uh, explode. And then the Japanese Americans also bombed an oil refinery, the former Texaco refinery at Mactan. This is the aftermath of the bombings. There's also a repair base and the naval base of midget submarines was on San Nicolas. And so they bombed San Nicolas and they hit the church you know, of San Nicolas which unfortunately, sadly, it survived the war. But, uh, my great granduncle, the parish priest, Father Venerando Reynes, with the consent of the bishop, decided to have it destroyed and replaced with a modern church, sadly. Uh, eventually, the, the, the Americans landed in Talisai. There was no resistance in Talisai when they landed. The Japanese instead booby-trapped the beach, put a lot of land mines with are connected to bigger uh, 100, uh, 500 pound bombs. And so when the Americans landed, there was no resistance, there was no firing, but I think four of them uh, died uh, immediately from these bombs, that, which were booby trapped like this, you know, <clears throat> like this, these kinds of uh, resistance. And here's one of the, of the uh, pillboxes that should have been used by the Japanese at Talisai Akansohong, very near the Liberation Monument but it was not used. And this is how they treated it now. Uh, and that's Dr. Rico Jose and I, uh, on the other side, Toledo, with uh, all these Japanese uh, dragon's teeth. They were expecting a landing also in Toledo. And many of these pillboxes built by the Japanese, which were moved to the back of the new city hall of Toledo when uh, they, it was developed instead of the contractor destroying the pillboxes. He had some of these pillboxes which could be hit by the flattening of the land, uh, move them behind the city hall and they look like clusters of pillboxes facing each other, which is not of course the way they would have been. On Saturday, they would not have been shooting at each other. Of course, they were on top of Ilihan Hill, which had a commanding view of, of Toledo's beaches as well as of the back of Toledo on the Mandugo, Magdugo field where the, Jeff, the Americans would be, they expected we'd be marching to the city. That did not happen, of course. The Americans landed in Toledo. I mean, Talisai, yeah. That's Talisai landing. Now, in the afternoon and the following day, they turned uh, uh, Pardo Church into a makeshift mobile hospital. And when I told the people of uh, those who went to, ch to church there that this was a mobile hospital, some of them could still remember, their, their, their grandchildren could still remember. Some of the Americans now gave, gave them towels, no? And, and uh, gave them souvenirs, chocolates. Unfortunately, many of the Japanese who were retreating to the mountains to start the defense, their defense of Cebu, burned so many places also that were not burned by the American bombings, no? Here is a burning of 
St. Teresa's College by the Japanese and you have these uh, sisters looking for whatever they could, they could salvage. This is the map of the Japanese 102nd Division and 102nd uh, Division command, uh, combat operations in, in, in Cebu. No? This is Cebu City. They decided that they would abandon the city and move the resistance to the back where you have what is called Babag Ridge. The word Babag in Cebuano means block, blockade. So you can imagine this is a set of hills that form the beginnings of the central Cebu Cordillera. So it's, it's flat city and then you have undulating hills where you have Marco Polo Hotel today. And that's where they decided the resistance would be at over the, those hills leading to Busay, uh, Buhisan. So you have Cochan Hill and on top of that is where Marco Polo uh, Hotel would be located today. And then you have the Buhisan Reservoir and Dam, um, which still exists to this day. They decided to create a series of defensive positions here, uh, waiting for the Americans to arrive. And they kept on bombing the American ships that would dock at the city. But then the Americans, of course, sent so many airplanes. First, they liberated Bactan so that they could land airplanes there. <clears throat> and then they decided to bomb the main uh, Japanese defense forces. The Japanese put up a resistance here. No, the Gochan Hill came, came claimed so many lives when a, they booby trapped a tunnel, and uh, and as the American forces were climbing the hill with so many pillboxes fi firing down on the Hoog um, airfield and uh, the area uh, down there, which are very expensive condominium units are built now there, including the IT park the information technology park, we have all these high rise buildings of the Ayala. The Americans and uh, the Japanese were firing, were firing down on them. So the Americans decided to climb up the hill. And it took them three days, I think, to, to claim that hill. And in one, in the on the second day of the climbing, the Japanese had booby trapped a tunnel, exploded it as the Americans were, American division soldiers, together with guerrillas were, were climbing up the hill and they were killed. No? A lot of them suffered as well this year. And you have all these uh, Americans firing at, up at Busai, near also at Lahug airfield. No, this is the airfield. You have tanks that are entering the airfield. At first, they were able to claim the airfield, but at night, the Japanese would come and you know, wreak all kinds of havoc on the field. Uh, and here's uh, firing uh, American unit firing at Busai, uh, Babag Ridge. That's the Babag Ridge. It really looks like a barrier. No? Here's a photo of the aftermath, April 16, of uh, the Japanese when they, they abandoned all their defense posts on the hill. Today, you find a lot of expensive resorts here, mountain resorts. And here would be the location of Marco Polo Hotel, somewhere here. Yeah. Then you have MacArthur visiting the, the site days after the, it was cleared. But the resistance of the Japanese continued up in the north. No? So you have Cebu liberated early around June, but the resistance of the Japanese would continue up north until the surrender on August 28th. So you have from 24 to 31, they were somewhere uh, in Liloan and Danau. And this is where you have so many Japanese killed and so many bones were left behind. And a lot of uh, Japanese came here during memorial, uh, memorial tours in the 1980s. They would go to the Nau and Carmen and Liloan to pray for their dead because so many of them would, would die along the way. Some of them were civilians, some were children. And this is the, the, the route to the, to the retreat of the Japanese and the booby traps they made on the road for uh, against tanks and all kinds of, of Americans coming in. So you have a lot of, of, suffer, of casualties on the American side. You have guerrillas. So, carrying litters uh, for the, 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 with, with, with American soldiers that were attacked. Eventually, however, uh, Japanese ran out of provisions and out of water as they established their resistance up in the north of Tabuelan, Tuburan, and Bogo. And so negotiations were held and the, the, the Americans uh, dropped leaflets uh, telling them that the Japanese had already, the Imperial Japanese rescript was off already. The Imperial, the Emperor 
Hirohito had already indicated that he would sign the instrument or he would ask his people to suffer the insufferable you know, in a radio broadcast. At first, the Japanese did not believe that. So they sent soldiers, you know, their officers, to rendezvous uh, in, uh, up north in Kadauhan, Kad Kaduawan, uh, Tabogon, at the border of Bourbon to Tabogon, to negotiate <clears throat> and to listen to the broadcast and to see the, the news reports. Uh, so the generals, Fouke, Tada, Tadaso, Katauka, I think uh, this is Fouke, this is Tada, 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 uh, Katauka, I think, would eventually believe the story and then they would surrender. So as against the uh, imperial rescript to die for the emperor, the rescript was already rescinded by then because of the announcement of the emperor. So they did not commit karakiri or you know, die to the end. So on uh, August 28th, much to the dislike of, of General MacArthur, who did not want the scene to be stolen from him, the megalomaniac General MacArthur was very angry at General William Arnold. That's the story of the, of the son, uh, Colonel Arnold, that his father was scolded by General MacArthur for starting the surrender ceremony on August 28th, way ahead of the actual surrender of the Japanese of, of Tokyo Bay, uh, board USS Missouri on September 2. That's about a few days ahead. No? So here's a photo of the surrender ceremony and the, and the Japanese uh, being sent to the city along the way as they would be sent to the city, lining the streets of the towns when they, they, they knew that the Japanese were coming with on board their, uh, their vehicles or American vehicles, American vehicles. They would be thrown rocks you know, and some would human feces would be thrown at them. The Americans had to, to drive away this, they are very angry Filipinos because on top of this, of this, this uh, trucks were also American soldiers guarding the Japanese. And then they would, they, all these rocks would also, bottles, rocks, all kinds of things were thrown at the Japanese, including human feces. And the American soldiers would also suffer the brunt. So they, they had to assign all these soldiers in the towns to stop throwing. That's how angry the, the Cebuanos were. So eventually, the, the, before at the start, September 1, I think they started repatriating Japanese soldiers. Many of them had wives, Filipino wives, and they asked to stay behind with their wives. And they said, no, if you stay behind, you'll be killed, including your wife and your children. And there would be, as they retreated, by the way, to the north, many soldiers would kill Japanese infants because they'd be very noisy, you no know, crying, no food, no water, no milk, or no, no, no very emaciated mothers. They would be killed and, and, and uh, a separate war crimes tribunal would be started in Japan against Japanese soldiers who killed their, uh, their forces who were, who were retreating and killing off their babies. Uh, so many of the Japanese, were, the American natives were also told to identify uh, those that committed atrocities uh, on their on them or on their relatives. And so there was a concentration at a military, a prisoner of war camp. There were two prisoners of war camp established in Cebu, one in Labangor, one in Tabunok, Talisay, where the Japanese who committed atrocities like this, these soldiers were, were incarcerated and eventually they were executed. Some of them were pardoned, of course, brought back to Japan, but many were executed. So look at Cebu, this is the aftermath of war, liberty ships, talked at a devastated Cebu. They, uh, in Manila, you say Manila was the dev most devastated city after war. So actually it's not only the southern portion of Manila was devastated, no, north of the passing was saved. The entire Cebu city was not saved. It's, was, it was totally destroyed. You only have vision theater. Oh, you only have, I can identify vision theater Cebu Normal University today, and the Capitol and Rizal Memorial Library, the only buildings still standing intact with their roofs. All the rest are shells. The entire Cebu city to the north up to the border of Mabolo and Mandawe were destroyed. That's Colegio de San Carlos, roofless already with walls destroyed. So Cebu is the most destroyed city in the Philippines. No, as we claim in our 
war in Cebu book. It's, it's not Manila that, that's the most devastated city after Warsaw. You have the entire city, you know, only three or four buildings standing. You know. But, you know, and then on the anniversary of, of the birthday of President Osmania, there was a big celebration. Uh, they, the Americans set up this, this uh, welcome arch, this victory arch made of sawali um, near the uh, capital and uh, Fuente Osmania. So how have we remembered uh, the war? Um, let me move this down so that you can see this. There are still war monuments and uh, veterans markers that still exist in Cebu. No? In Danao, there's in Cebu City at Plaza Independencia, in Dumanghug and Ronda, Tabogo and Samoa, but the rest have not. The American division put up in 2014, a 2014 a marker at the surrender site or in, in Tabogon, Kaduawan. Those are the only ones that you, you have for remembering. But the Japanese, on the other hand, have put up so many markers, which is very ironic. There are so very few markers of the veterans left in Cebu. But the Japanese individually or in groups have put up markers. At Marco Polo Hotel, they have a, a canon, a canyon, a canyon, the, canon the, statue, the statue of Canon, the goddess of mercy, and a marker to all the Fili Japanese and Filipinos who died. And every August, Nine during the anniversary of the bombing at Nagas at Hiroshima, August six, I think, and <clears throat> they come together to 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 pray and to remember the war. Nobody does this among Filipinos. No, there's March twenty six liberation landing anniversary done by the city of Talisay, but there is no such thing as remembering those who died in the war. Uh, a monument like this, no, there's none. No, there's only a monument to liberate of the liberation. But so many of the buildings still survive. UP College, Cebu, uh, the Capitol, not so many, but very few. And then you have Gochan Hill that still survives. It's now privately owned. There's no marker there. In Lilo there are still remainders of the pillboxes there of the US Navy at Cebu Normal University. The Campaitai headquarters is now a warehouse or something. There is no marker there. It's a small marker put up by the Cebu Normal University to remember the war, but they repainted it. All the, all the marks put up by the people who died, who were incarcerated there. There used to be, according to the, one of the survivors who published a book, My Memoirs of War, Ahovito Venera, they used to mark with uh, all the days that they were there and the names of those who were there. Someone, some president of the university painted it over in the 2000s, 2010, I think, or 20. 2008, did not think of the historic value of, of uh, and the, only the ghosts of the Kampaytay uh, victims are there. And then you have all these uh, pillboxes and, uh, in Toledo that are still also unmarked and unprotected. So things need to be done. And I hope the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office can get funding to, well, at least create a World War II Heritage Trail, work with local governments. We are trying to do this for Cebu, for, for Cebu province, but I, I'm not a consultant of Cebu City, so I cannot, cannot, I can only recommend to Cebu City to, to do what, what must be done for the, the, the remnants of war in the city. So what is to be done? Well, publish memoirs. The, my own office, the USC Press, has published these books. But this is how much we can do, no? And so I hope, well, so I hope we can do more, no? So I'd like to thank the PIVAO and all the others and the Masaya Subbo, you know, my base, and uh, the US, uh, USA Museum, and all of these. So references for the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope you, you, enjoy, you, you were able to learn something from the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We have learned a lot from that very wonderful presentation.
We would like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Jose Jobers Eliazar Arbor Salas. Sir, if you're there. Yes, we invite sir. You. Yes, sir. Uh, I believe I believe we intend to clarify some. Uh, you have some clarification, sir, to make. Oh, well, I forgot to discuss the Koga incident. It's a yes. very important portion of the of our achievement of the guerrillas was to the, the discovery of uh, well, the, the plane that that Admiral Minechi Koga wrote, wrote on crust in San Fernando and the papers that were that floated were eventually reached the guerrillas. And there is a claim, it's a claim in um, among guerrillas in Cebu that the those papers which were eventually brought, brought to the Southwest Pacific Command Headquarters of MacArthur, uh, after translation, they, they advanced the, the timetable for the American landing in the Philippines and moved the location from Mindanao or Davao or Sarangani province to Tacloban. But you will not find in any, in, in any of the records, even in MacArthur's memoirs, he does not mention this incident at all that it, it helped you know, the discovery of the show papers, which detailed the uh, defense preparations of the Imperial Japanese Navy in the Philippines. And it showed that the preparations were, were, were not in the Visayas. And so the Visayas was a weak spot. So uh, the claim from uh, the guerrilla side from Colonel uh, Segura, who wrote the, the Koga incident book was that it forwarded, it advanced the landing by about two or three months and moved it from Sarangani to Tacloban in the Visayas. That, that's all I'd like to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, sir. We have learned a lot from that very wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we now open the floor for the questions from the audience and the public. For our Facebook viewers, please place your questions on the comment section. And for the Zoom participants, please place your questions on our chat box. Again, we now open the floor for the questions from the audience and the public. For our Facebook viewers, please place your questions on the comment section and for the Zoom participants, Please place your questions on our chat box. Okay, I believe, sir, we have our first question. One of our viewers would like to know what is the significance of the Second World War in Cebu in relation to its liberation, sir? Well, of course, uh, the liberation is very important to Cebuanos. No? It, it, the, the landing itself is still commemorated uh, in Talisay. But uh, I think that lately, you know, uh, because of generational changes, you have guerrillas already dying out. You know, and uh, many of these guerrillas never talk about what they did during the war. So the memory is fading. It's still significant in the sense that we would not be enjoying our freedoms today. Or we would we would probably be speaking Nihongo today if the Japanese were not were not uh, we were not liberated from the brutal years of the Japanese occupation. There is another uh, train of thought about that that we'd probably be industrialized, but under the under the influence of Japan. You know? So it, it is significant in that sense that uh, three years of brutal rule uh, ended because of the, of the liberation. Could it agree more, sir? Thank you very much. The next question. So the next question, sir, is how important is the resistance of Cebu in the liberation campaign by the Allied forces in society? Well, er early on, it was clear that MacArthur wanted guerrilla groups to be organized, you know, to be disciplined, to communicate clearly with one another, to follow uh, military discipline. So it was clear that MacArthur recognized that he needed intelligence, guerrilla, and only the guerrillas could provide that kind of intelligence that eventually uh, allowed the Southwest Pacific Command and the 7th Fleet to prepare for 
the eventual uh, liberation of the Philippines. If not for the guerrilla resistance, uh, it's not like today, you know, where you can use satellites to spy uh, on, on what's going on in the Philippines or in any other country. So I would imagine without the guerrilla resistance, without guerrillas supplying intelligence you know, and, and uh, decimating the enemy as it were, controlling the enemy's movements and confining them to larger towns and cities while liberating the rest of the of the islands or of the of, of a given province you no know? it would have been difficult you will realize in when you read when you read american uh, books written about the philippines it's very strange they do not they they, they there's just a few lines about the guerrillas you no know? Well, you have to understand it's the United States that wants to show that it was their firepower, their, their military might, their, their, uh, their, uh, their weapons that eventually uh, saved the Philippines. But there are, in, in between these, these, the, these books, you can read that they, they do mention the role of guerrillas in gathering intelligence and preparing the eventual uh, liberation. So that is why it is incumbent. It's also good that guerrillas did not did not uh, just kept quiet. That there are many uh, guerrillas who eventually wrote about their experiences, because well, understandably, the United States had very little to say about what was going on inside the Philippines during the occupation, because they were not here. These American writers and soldiers were not here. So it, it's incumbent, it's also good that the guerrillas, especially lately, the, the, their children, their grandchildren are publishing their memoirs because that part of the story of the defense and the liberation of the Philippines also needs to be told. Indeed, American firepower uh, liberated us in that sense because it, the, the, the Japanese Navy was already destroyed in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, but they would not have the Battle of Leyte Gulf would not have happened if not for guerrilla intelligence. No? And so that is that has to be recognized also. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have another one here, but this is not actually a question. This is a comment from Leandro Beltran, one of our three participants. He says, true, I saw in the document after the war in 1945, all the guerrillas sent the entire casualties, but um, Arthur never mentioned the achievement of guerrillas by capturing all the papers. Yeah. Okay, um, one of our viewers would like to know, did the Cebuanos join in the defense of Bataan in Corregidor? Y yes, uh, there were many Cebuanos who died in Bataan. There, also, there were also many who survived. I know one who survived uh, um, <clears throat> and never talked about it after. Oh had all the medals, had all the, uh, the, the, the uh, wherewithal of the experience, including the death march and uh, rehabilitation trainings at, at Kapas. No? He had all these documents, uh, but he never talked about it to his family. With, uh, there, 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 uh, Colonel Segura's father himself was there at Bataan and did not survive. His body was never found. Colonel Segura, the author of Tabunan, the, guerrilla, the exploits of the Cebu guerrillas, his father was never found, but there were many of them, there are quite a number, were from Cebu and most of them were studying in Manila at UP or other universities when uh, the war happened or at the Philippine Constabulary Academy when the war happened. So they, they had to join the, the, the defense of Bataan. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next question is, what is the difference in the objective and maintenance of war memorials erected by the Filipinos and Japanese? Uh, I didn't get that. What is the... What is the difference in the objective and maintenance of war memorials erected by the Filipinos and the Japanese? Well, the, the Japanese have built, built all kinds of Memorial. Some of them are personal memorials. They bring uh, wooden plaques with the names of their soldiers, of their relatives 
who died and they used to go there they, they used to be a memorial tour in the 1980s every year organized between philippine uh, tour tour operators and japanese their japanese counterparts and they would come here to cebu uh, i i know for a fact that at the university of san carlos until about 1982 there used to be a japanese uh, there used to be a small altar at the basement where the japanese could pray because from time to time you would we would have at, at the downtown campus or the former main campus we would have japanese tourists coming in asking if they could go to to the basement because their relative died there and they would bring all these names of, of plaques of cemetery names that are practiced in japan there are many places in carmen up north where the the eventual the, the many of the deaths of the japanese happened during the retreat to the north around april uh, 20 21st to august uh, 28 the surrender uh, date most of them are in the towns of liloan compostela danao tabuela they they have set mark set up markers there some of them have donated to schools to public schools there uh, on their own no our problem our problem i think is i, I don't understand why uh, it's generational no? many many uh, mayors who took over did not experience the war no and and so they they took away these monuments and expanded their plazas or put up uh, a, a a mall uh, on, on the area where there used to be a a war memorial a, a memorial to the war so the, so you see personal uh, mem mem memorials personal remembering is more powerful than than official remembering no if it's official it it, get, it tends to be abstract it, you don't during uh, in, in, in 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 annual celebrations you no longer hear for example uh, all the names of the people who died being read no? so it's it's more official it's it's a com it's required it's compliance it's you have to do this because it's the anniversary and there are so many of our people who died but the emotion is no longer there that's what i'm trying to say unlike the japanese but you know you must know that this this current generation in japan is not coming to the philippines anymore you organize a memorial tour for grandchildren of japanese soldiers you will not have any takers i don't think they will come here many of them no in, in groups i've experienced twice only in the last five years of, of, of talking about the war and, and, and writing about the war. I've experienced only two times where a Japanese emailed to me that he would be coming over to look, to go to a town to drop flowers on the sea because his grandfather uh, died on a boat that sunk or that his grandfather was, was killed in, uh, during the retreat to the north. So it's also becoming less emotional for the Japanese. And when, when that happens, I think it's incumbent on the state to take over and continue remembering, continue remembering and taking care of, of these remaining uh, monuments because those who do not remember will repeat the mistakes or the errors or yeah, of the past. So we have, we have to remember. Very good point, sir. Thank you very much. Now, speaking of war memorials, our next question is, uh, do you have any possible area or location in mind where we can create or build a World War II national military shrine? Maybe, sir, we can start in uh, Cebu. Where in Cebu would you like a uh, World War II national military, military shrine to be built? Well, the, a, a good place would be Tabunan, where the guerrilla resistance uh, was based no, and was twice attacked and rebuilt. No? But it's up there in the mountains, very cold. It's like, it's called the Baguio. Like, it's almost like temperatures of Baguio during summer, not during during uh, December, but during summer months in Baguio, it would be like that. The temperature is about 20 to 24 degrees. And that would be a good place to put up a shrine. But, you know, uh, I don't know if I should tell you this, but when I, I sit in a Cultural Historical Affairs Commission of Cebu City. And when we, we told the, the barangay to put up a marker for Tabunan as headquarters, 
we had an adverse response from the Barangay Council. I don't know for one reason. Maybe they didn't like the idea of a part of their of their state property and Barangay property would be used for a small part. No, we, we, I still don't know what the reason was. And yeah, that, so it might be difficult there. The other is at, at Plaza Independencia, which used to be the marching grounds of the Spanish uh, and, and then the Americans and then the Filipinos. If, if we could to put a, a, a shrine there, there's already a monument there to the war, which looks very strange. It looks like a horn of a carabao uh, made into abstract. I do not understand why it's like that, but that will be a good place. For San Pedro was uh, the military headquarters of the Visayas Mindanao Force. And so it's, 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 it's quite strange that when you go to Fort San Pedro, you do not see any military marker there, no museum of, of the war, but that, that should be a good place for a shrine. That's a fort, it's a military installation. That's very interesting, sir. One of our viewers is curious, what is the relevance of having an American officer in commanding the resistance in Cebu? Well, I've, I've, I've been asking myself that uh, many times, why it was not a Filipino. <clears throat> I think it's, it, it was part of the, the emergency of the moment that, uh, that there were Americans uh, who were already inducted into the USAFE who decided to uh, lead the guerrilla movement in Cebu. Besides, uh, Cushing had quite a, 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 a reputation uh, of his exploits. Um, there was one, uh, I think that there was one uh, incident when the Japanese bombed the Texaco, so the Texaco oil mill uh, in Opon, which I showed earlier, was also bombed by the, Ameri uh, the Americans during liberation. During the, in the run up, to the April 10 invasion, the Japanese would come, send their planes from time to time to bomb this uh, Texaco oil mill. And there was this incident where, where in, in order to prevent the oil mill, the, the tank from exploding, Cushing climbed it. And I think did something to protect it from explosion from a bomb. And it, 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 it created a story, a ripple effect among among Cebuanos, no, that that he was a brave man, that he, he was gung ho, and that yeah, the usual the usual things that people say of brave people, maybe he has anting anting, maybe he is, you know, destined by the divine providence to be of importance to to the future of of, of, of defending uh, Cebu. I, I think those are the that's one of the incidents that that are reported here uh, that that made him, uh, uh, that made the locals romanticize his, his identity, his, his persona, that made him a, a, a good leader of the, of the guerrilla. The other, the other thing was that he was self-effacing. Uh, in fact, he died, that, he died on, bo on board a, a boat on the way to Palawan or on one of his uh, mining uh, prospecting events without anyone recognizing that he was the famed guerrilla officer, Colonel Kashin. There, there is a story, uh, I think, serialized in the graphic uh, magazine of the 1950s, where he lived in Manila on a small room and the landowner never knew that he was a guerrilla leader. He was simply saying, never talked about it, never wrote his memoirs, never accepted any accolades or any Recognitions. I, we do not have any stories of him attending annual uh, gear, uh, celebration of the liberation. He was self-effacing. He didn't like publicity, and and that's the sad part of Cushing. But that is also what I think endeared him to the Cebuanos. He had no qualms. He, he was the a direct opposite, in other words, of Fenton, who was a megalomaniac who loved the limelight. I mean, you know, manager of a radio station. He he virtually ran the whole show. So he loved uh, publicity and opposite, that's why I think they had a strange relationship because opposite him was a man who, when MacArthur uh, demoted him for surrendering the Japanese officers in the Koga incident, because there are many officers survive, who survived the, 
the the war uh, the the crash of the of uh, the the two airplanes the Kawanishi uh, boats uh, the, air, the airplanes seaplanes they were arrested and, and and brought to Tabunan but because the Japanese were at, were creating a, an atrocious attack all over the towns unless the guerrillas would release the soldiers the, the officers including General uh, Fukudome no Shigeru Fukudome who would survive the war you no. Know, he had to release them. He did not know he was a brigadier general, by the way. He had to release them in order to stop the Japanese uh, general, uh, I think that was Tanaka, was it Onishi, Onishi from, from, from pillaging the towns, from, from arresting anyone, executing anyone, and causing havoc in all the southern towns, looking for these people, for these soldiers, and the, and the papers. So he defied um, military orders, no, that the standard code and did not wait for MacArthur's instructions about what to do with the soldiers. He took cognizance of the fact that people in the town, civilians, were being slaughtered unless the guerrillas were released. I, I mean, the soldiers were released. And he was demoted for that. And I think that endeared him further to the guerrillas because he was willing, willing to take, to, 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 suck, to, to you know, take uh, I mean, take the side of the civilians, I mean, care for the civilians more than the military objective, which of course, if you're a military man, that's not something you should be doing. So he had a heart in that sense. Long answer, but anyway, I hope I answered that question. Thank you so much, sir. Um, follow up question, before we proceed to the follow-up question to that one, uh, we would like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Ernesto Carolina, our legal administrator, good afternoon, sir. Now, here's a follow-up question to that. How about Talisay Landing Site, sir, and Mactan Shrine to be declared as national site? The, 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 the Talisay Landing Site has a national historical landmark already. The uh, landing site is uh, carries a national historical landmark. The airport does not have does not have any. Bunker that it, it, it used to be an American, I mean, a Japanese air base. And if not for the liberation of Mactan Air Base first, the airplanes coming from Ormok, Bye Bye, uh, which were bombing B Babag and Busai, the mountains, up in the city to flush out the Japanese, would have taken longer because Lahug airfield was still occupied from, by the Japanese for about four days or three days after the liberation. So once they liberated Bactan uh, on March 27, a day after, they could now land their airplanes there and, and refuel and all that and, and start bombing the hills that form a barrier uh, behind the city of Cebu. So there's no marker there. Uh, the sad thing is there are, in, in, in Kansohong, there is one single pillbox left by the Japanese, which I think figures in some of the photographs and illustrations. And... Uh, Talisay City College cleaned it up, put up, you know, uh, the barriers and, and beautiful and light and all that. But it's privately owned and eventually you can only do so much. Our problems, I think, have to do with that. No, many of the remainders of the war are privately owned. And, uh, well, the owner, uh, uh, except for RA-1066, the owner can be held liable for destroying it. But you can also compel him. To, to give it to the state for, for to take care of it, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. From Reggie Sabandal of Pivao FSTO Cebu, very informative history, Sir Jobbers. I hope that this history of Cebu becomes part of the curriculum of DepEd so that children and the youth can appreciate our beautiful history of Cebu province, sir. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm willing to work with the Department of Education to encapsulate the book we, we wrote to, to create capsule lesson plans uh, and, and maybe a small uh, volume uh, for elementary school students and, and, and high school students uh, to learn about uh, that period in our history. Yeah, surely, sir, that would be a very, a very valuable endeavor. Now, next question, sir. Now, did the Second World War affect the cultural integrity of the island? Well, yeah. I mean, 
if you look at heritage wise what 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 resulted from from the the war well we lost our spanish era uh, heritage houses they were all burned you no know? uh, parian district was destroyed there's only one two structures left there uh, with uh, with um, coral coral stone walls and and uh, roof a uh, tile roof i mean this is the same all over the philippines no san pablo city virtually lost its entire uh, historic core no because uh, the, the 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 because it was burned during the war and so many, so many places are like that no so in terms of the tangible heritage of our past in terms of the spanish colonial period and also of the american colonial uh, period in terms of architecture we lost so much we lost so much yeah so i hope that answers the question yes sir it did, it did sir thank you very much now oh, by the way many churches also got destroyed uh, up north no well if you told the uh, osebo you'll be surprised that all the spanish era churches from Cebu City down to the south are still intact. It's clear that the, war, the liberation did not happen there. The liberation started from northern Cebu, starting in, in the northern portion of Cebu, Lahog, to Bogo, and you can barely find any Spanish era church standing there except in the now, I think, and Consolacion and all the rest. They're all cement, they're all post-war because, uh, because they were in fact bombed. as the liberation forces started flushing out the japanese so that that's a sad impact of the war thank you so much for explaining that sir thank, thank you uh, yes uh, el familiano what are the implications or lessons learned from the japanese invasion or aggression for any eventual future foreign aggression uh one <clears throat> when when white clouds are coming i think it's incumbent for example for universities for people with 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 historic and archival collections to begin storing them elsewhere not to find special storage places for our cultural resources because cebu the archbishop's palace in cebu for example was hit by an by american bombs including the cathedral so we lost all the archival records of the church no so all records all all your all all books especially about cebu must be kept somewhere no uh, to prepare for war uh, and as much as possible we must avoid being the target of an enemy no when superpowers fight against each other it's not the superpowers that go to war it's their pawns no it's when america and china now are having well they have this trade war that will many many uh, political pundits many political scientists many military experts uh, predict will eventually result in an escalation of of uh, of war footing at least no or of threats of war who will suffer it's not the united states nor china that will bomb each other it's the it's the so called client states it's the states that support them one or the other and in the philippines in the case of the philippines we're clearly right in the middle of an ongoing conflict that's also affecting our uh, the, the, our west philippine sea you know? and so we have to be very careful and tread carefully on 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 how we prepare for the eventually eventuality of of uh, an escalation not just of propaganda but of of uh, of war mongering among the two no and so the under secretary of defense can probably answer more more questions about preparing for war but for me we have to be we have to to secure our cities um, in the in europe they put a uh, blue shield on buildings that uh, that are marked with gps that are to be identified by airplanes or even soldiers that they have to be preserved and not to be hit during war and it, it's it's part of unesco charters that uh, cultural properties resources should not fall prey to war but i come from the field of heritage so my answer will always be about that 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 field so it's it's quite limited but i hope 
you understand from where I'm coming from. Because uh, in terms of military capabilities and preparation, I am not an expert on how to prepare the Philippines militarily. So I will not be able to answer that part of the question. Okay, thank you very much for that answer, sir. Now, regarding Cebu's geographical location, does this hinder the Allied forces to defend the island, and did this lead to its destruction, sir? Uh, well, if you read the, the records, the operations plans, the, the, target, the target was to go directly to Manila, no? To Luzon. In fact, they went directly via Mindoro, Alalita, and then via Mendoro, and then Manila, no? Victor II only happened because uh, there were still Japanese left here. And the America, the Japanese could actually transfer their airplanes, their whatever they had left to the to Lahog airfield. There was a strategic importance for Cebu for the Americans to send the American division to destroy whatever remnants of airports, airfields, and other facilities. And midget submarines were still plying this this area. In fact, I think three or four midget submarines were destroyed here during the liberation. No, so so that it, it, it did play a strategic importance only in so far as preventing secondary bases for the Japanese for whatever uh, resources they still had left. No, that if the fighting was concentrated on Luzon, the Japanese could could go down south. No, and move their resources to the south. So you had to cover all your bases. So I don't, I don't think the Philippi, the uh, Americans uh, selected which areas, but they timetabled which had priority and which had secondary priority. And if you notice in the plans, we, we became Victor II. The whole Cebu and Negros, we were on the second Victor plan. That means Victor I had to proceed first, neutralize, the facilities there, the, the enemy there, and then move to the secondary uh, resources. So we were still part of the secondary strategic uh, plans of the, of the Americans. Okay, sir, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Now, this is from Reggie Sabandal of Sibao FSEO Cebu. Sir, it says here, is there already initiative, sir, undertaken or collaboration with DepEd and SHED leading to the incorporation of such great history of Cebu to be part of the curriculum? I would be interested also, sir, that this history of ours in Cebu be part of the subject in school for, uh, in school for graders, high school, and college. May I know your contact number, sir, for more details and knowledge of Cebu province history during World War II for this such history compilation, sir? will be a great IEC material for our advocacy campaign, which yeah. also our main goal of CBAO in order to inculcate in the minds of our younger generation for the recognition and appreciation on the great contribution of World War II veterans. Maybe for your email. Uh, how would Dr. Reddy reach you? Uh, okay, uh, I have a Facebook page. But anyway, uh, it has to be an initiative from Deb Ed and Chen. No matter how much we do, no matter how much we we write, if you're not within the system of, of preparing curriculum plans and in, adding in, 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 what is that? In the, sub, in the subject on, uh, in the elementary on social studies or whatever history, if it's not added there, then we'll just be a reference. We'll just be a reference material. So it does, I think it's incumbent on the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office to compare the Ped and, and, and Chen. And I was reeling, there's so many people writing on the, on, on the local uh, events that happened during World War II in every locality. There's always that. So I think all authors are just waiting. Um, in, in, for my part, I'm willing to, to help. No, I have a Facebook page. It's Jobos Reynes Bersales. Um, you, you can add me there or you can visit me at Museo Subbo. There's a, I set up a Wargate Memorial Gallery at Museo Subbo. And, and, and see, that, that can help people understand the war, you know, because Filipinos are very tactile and very visual. It's hard to, to write thick books. <laughs> we have to be more visual. And, and maybe the existence of a museum or a gallery helps 
remind people of, of, of the past. No? So at Museo Subo, I'm always uh, around, so I, I can be contacted there also. Or at the USA Museum. Thank you so much, sir. Um, this one is from Gian Mayo. He, uh, he is curious, did the uh, use of the a backbone of the guerrilla movement, just like what they did in Metro? The use of it? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah yes. Many of the use of it did not surrender. In fact, uh, the way the, the way the 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 aid, the Filipino aid, I forgot his name, uh, David, I think, of Chinuet said it was that they were required to surrender. It's in the order. It's in the order of General Wainwright. They were all required to surrender, uh, but that the decision would be up to them what to do. You no, know, a personal decision. So I think they created a token. Uh, they they decided on, on a token delegation of surrender, but all the rest removed their, threw away their uniforms, but kept their guns, buried them near their houses, according to uh, Segura in, in Tabunan, awaiting for the moment when a guerrilla movement would arise in Cebu. And the guerrilla movement did rise in Cebu. Somewhere around September, 5, September 1942, it was already formalized. But even in May, June, July uh, 1942, there were already skirmishes with, with Japanese individual uh, use of soldiers ambushing or fighting or killing one soldier here or the other. Until eventually it was organized into a cohesive unit. So many of them, yes, were from Yusafe. The saddest part of this, and I'm sure it's all over the Philippines, was the volunteer guards who were too young to become soldiers, but fed the guerrillas, so provided them with all kinds of provisions, no? Kamote, uh, sending letters, uh, carrying loads for the guerrillas. They were 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 14-year-olds. They were never recognized by the, uh, the American government because they were not in the roster of, of, of the Cebu Area Command. And so many of them died without recognition. You know, many of them. Uh, it, it's a common issue, I think. Uh, it became a very emotional issue in the 60s and 70s. Mark, President Marcos even used it you know, uh, to get more concessions from the United States. Yeah. OK, thank you very much, sir. We have another question. This is from Scotty Michael Q. Navarro. Was General William Sharp in Cebu during the Japanese invasion in Cebu, and what happened to him, sir? No, he was in Mindanao, and he surrendered. I think, if I remember, I think he surrendered, and was probably incarcerated at USD. I know one well, is that they split the Visayas Mindanao force a few a few days before, I think three weeks before the the invasion. And you know what? Never liked Sharp. If you read this. His uh, Bellamy Park memoirs. Sharp is <laughs> caricatured there as a as a disorganized person who didn't know what to do, who was a megalomaniac, who was just thinking of himself. Blah blah blah. You have all Chinuet bearing out his anger at the ill preparation of of the of Cebu because the one who headed it was so disorganized. General William Sharp, something like that. Sharp went to Mindanao. Uh, three weeks before, I think, the invasion, and was ahead of them, Mindanao force there. Now, it's Colonel Fertig who became the head of the guerrillas. That, that means Sharp followed Wainwright's order to surrender uh, at pain of being uh, called a deserter, which is an important, uh, which is a very, very, and I'm sure for military people, to be called a deserter is, is a disgrace, no? Uh, so that Sharp did surrender, I think, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, next question, and I think this will be our last one for this afternoon. This is from Maria Cecilia A. Medes. Is there any commemoration in Cebu related to history or World War II? Yeah, yes, every March 26, the uh, liberation, the landings at Talisay is uh, commemorated, complete with helicopters and armor lights. <laughs> in 2014, I brought, I mean, veterans from Vietnam 
of the American division. So the, the children, the next generation, the veterans of uh, American Division 33, I think 33 or 31, which is actually American division. They were veterans of the Vietnam War. They came here, they were very, very old, 70s. They wanted to retrace all the battle sites, all that for four, seven days. They, I, I told them around, it was a private event. I just, they just contacted me after that. We told all the sites that we could reach, including the surrender site of the Japanese up north, where they put up a marker. They eventually put up a monument uh, there. They bought property there and they put up a sur surrender monument there to honor the American division, not the Japanese, of course. <clears throat> and then they joined the, the Talisa landing event and they were surprised that there were helicopters and, uh, and Marines and uh, armor lights. And I said, you have to understand that. There's, it's just a reenactment, no? but uh, sometimes people laugh, why are there helicopters? There were no helicopters in World War II. But that's the way they, they reenact the war. Yeah. Wow, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bersales, for responding. Thank you, also. Our, thank you very much, sir. Now, before we end our open forum, sir, um, we may proceed to the next part of the program. May we now have a photo op together with our resource speaker. To our dear participants, you may now turn your cameras on. Again, we invite everyone for the photo op, please. Have your cameras on and ready. Hi, oh, Dr. Rico is there. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Joe. Hello. Good talk. Nice to see you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, everyone, please ready for the first photo. Please stay still. And again, for another photo. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for participating thank in our. Much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating in our QA and for sending in your questions. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Bersales, for responding to our thank viewers. You. Yes, sir. Now, ladies and Gentlemen, we have finally reached the end of this series. In our mission to propagate heroic deeds and promote historical awareness among the younger generation and the future generations to come, the Kalitingan, the Piva Historical Webinar Series 2021 was created. With that, we are very much delighted to everyone who never left us and consistently joined us in every discussions and lecture. Most especially, we would like to extend our sincere appreciation and recognition to all our recent speakers who have shared their time and effort with us towards reaching this goal. We wouldn't have been able to do this without you. Thank you very much. With this, it is an honor to present you the Certificate of Appreciation as a research speaker in the Kajikingan, the People Historical Webinar Series 2021. Let me read the content. Certificate of Appreciation in recognition of their valuable contribution as one of the research speakers in the Kabitinga and the Pivo Historical Webinar Series held on February to May 2021. The certificates have been signed by the following. Professor Neil Marshall Santillan, PhD, Chairperson of the Department of History of the University of the Philippines, Assistant Professor Marlon F. Aguayagoy, MC, Chairperson of the Department of History of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Associate Professor Archie B. Rezos, PhD, Chairperson of the Department of History, University of San Tomas, Associate Professor Jose Romel B. Hernandez, PhD, Chairperson of the Department of History, De La Salle University, Francis Theodore B. Inatorio, Administrator of Mount Samad F. Sensiaza, Miguel Angelo Zagiria, first vice president of Philippine Veterans Bank. Chris Tuto L. Aguilar, executive director of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Undersecretary Ernesto G. Carolina, 
Administrator of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office, lastly, Secretary Delphine N. Lorenzana, the Secretary of the, Nas of the Department of National Defense. We would like to uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Service Center in the Fourth, Ms. Marie Silva Vallejo, and Dr. Ricardo Lucas. Once again, thank you very much, Mom and Sir. The certificate is hereby awarded to Dr. Ricardo C. Jose of the University of the Philippines Cinnamon to discuss, to discuss the Kalitinan Filipino courage and selflessness during the Battle of Manila, February 1945. He presented the stories of the unsung heroes who courageously served the Filipino people amid this difficult battle. The same certificate is hereby awarded to Ms. Desri Ann C. Benipayo the Vice President for Research and Education of the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation, who presented a series of pictures projecting the events that happened during the Battle of Manila. The same certificate is awarded to Dr. Russo V. Diviana. He presented the Yamashita treasure myth or reality, an old fable story that led to several engagements in treasure hunting. Dr. Diviana countered the mythological hearsay about the alleged treasure that was looted by General Tomoyuki Yamashita during the war. The same certificate is hereby awarded to Dr. Ray Carlos C. Gonzalez, a professor in the University of the Philippines, Visaya. He dealt on the life of General Macario Peralta and the 6th military district. Dr. Gonzalez provided a well presented chronological discussion on the war in Panay while, while highlighting the role of General Sarata and the The same certificate is hereby awarded to Dr. Ricardo Drota Jose, who delivered his presentation on the Balantang Memorial Cemetery National Shrine the only military cemetery established outside the Metro Manila. During the Second World War, the liberation of Panay was led by the 6th Military District under the command of General Macario Peraza Jr., by which Dr. Jose regarded them as the best organized guerrilla force outside the zone. The same certificate is awarded to Dr. Augusto V. Diviana. He presented Mount Samat in the Battle of Bataan, its historical significance. Dr. Diviana focused his discussion in the Suwano military shrine and the history of the battles that took place in the province. With the use of geography, Dr. Diviana projected the situation in Bataan during the war and along with that, he provided analysis to further explain these details. The same certificate is awarded to the executive director of the National Commission of the Philippines. The same certificate is hereby awarded to Assistant Professor Dondi Pepito G. Ramos, who presented the life of Nicolasa Dairit Panlilio. Coming from a wealthy family in Pampanga, Nicolasa contributed to the 1896 Philippine Revolution and was known as the peacemaker of the revolution. The same certificate is awarded to Assistant Professor Francis Malban. He discussed the contribution of the Filipina chemist Maria Ilagan Orosa. An intelligent mind, Maria contributed to food chemistry by inventing various nutritious foods such as the banana ketchup, soy lac, and developed a way to prolong the shelf life of food. The same certificate, the same certificate is hereby awarded to Assistant Professor Francisco Jaime Paulo A. Villan. He discussed the contributions of Kaihaja Fatima Pantabaita. 
regarded as one of the most outstanding Muslim women, assistant professor Liam emphasized the heroism and achievement made by Fahadja The same certificate is hereby awarded to Dr. Marcelino Macapinlac, who demonstrated how a reconstruction of the history of the guerrilla movement in southern Luzon can be undertaken by using digital materials such as PFAO's Brigadier General Francisco Licuanan Jr. Collection as sources of information. The same certificate is awarded to Dr. Ricardo Trotangote. He presented the Bataan Death March, Courage Amid Atrocity. We told the story of the infamous Death March, where thousands of Filipinos and Americans, both soldiers and civilians, died. The same, the same certificate is awarded to Mr. Vicente Luis of Court, the great grandson of Brigadier General Vicente, the commanding general of the 41st Philippine Army Division in Southern Luzon. He discussed the personal experiences his great grandfather encountered in the war. The same certificate is now awarded to Dr. Earl Jude Cleope, a professor from the Siliman University who presented his lecture on the Japanese account of the liberation of Negros Island. His presentation focused on providing the historical events that transpired in Negros during the Second World War in the Philippines through the lens of the Japanese account. The same certificate is awarded to Miss Marie Vallejo. She presented the lecture on the Battle of Brigitte, expounding on the activities of the organized command of the 10th Military District in Mindanao, led by Colonel Claro Laureta, and the 130th Infantry Regiment of Major Silva during the Liberation Campaign. The same certificate is hereby awarded to Dr. Maria Guisa Sipokota. She presented her discussion on the Makapili and other Filipino paramilitary groups during the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. Exploring the period Dark Age, Dr. Tan explained the stories of various groups that collaborated and supported the enemy during the war, one of which was the Malayan Katipunan ng mga Filipino, famously known as the Makapi, the most potent of the military collaborators. The same certificate is hereby awarded to Dr. Augusto V. De Viana of the University of Santo Tomas, who shared to us the issue of collaboration during the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. And lastly, the same certificate is awarded to Dr. Jobert Bertales. Today, he discussed the story of the war in Cebu during the Second World War in the Philippines. Again, we thank all of these speakers for participating in our webinars and we now invite our said speakers, our resource speakers, to please turn on their cameras for a photo up together. With our Undersecretary yes. Ernesto D. Carolina Arsico Okay, um, we invite our speakers, if they, uh, would you like to say something? Um, can we start with Dr. Ricardo Trota, Jose? First, I'd like to thank uh, FIVAO for organizing this and together with them also, Veterans Bank. Uh, I'd like to congratulate all the speakers. I think all the presentations were very interesting. Interesting, very mind opening. I'm glad that uh, all together, if the uh, whole next series can be another form, maybe a more permanent form, a published form, or a DVD or something, because there's so much interesting information that has come out in all the presentations that uh, it would be so nice to have it in a more uh, permanent form. Thank you and uh, congratulations. We have uh, Miss Marie Silva Valiejo. Yeah. I have to unmute myself. 
I wanted to thank Viva and you said Carolina for organizing all of this and his people who are so well adept in doing this. And to the speakers also who came, I learned a lot because my area is only Mindanao. So knowing more about the other areas, it's very interesting. Uh, let's see. So um, I hope we can continue this. Um, in my talk and in, in the others, I noticed that always the depth ed is always brought up and whether they are involved in this. So, you know, I, I, then I just, I wonder what can be done that depth ed will actually put this as part of their curriculum. Because this has always happened every year, you always hear this. So maybe, I don't know, people can lead a charge or somebody else can lead the charge to just start talking with depth ed on this. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, we also have Mr. Vicente Lim the Fort. Sir, would you like to share some words? Um, I'd just like to thank uh, Piva and the rest of the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk in this series. Um, it's always nice to be able to share and it was an honor to be among the speakers. Um, also, I commend uh, Piva and the rest of the organizers for um, being so committed with so many uh, very well organized talks and hopefully uh, this will not be the last time. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, Sir Dober? Well, I'd like to thank uh, and congratulate the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office for organizing this. And I hope we follow through as Mom Marie has stated and also Rico that we follow through on, on remembering. I've, I've always been concerned about remembering and then forgetting. And we are now at the crux of uh, the threshold of the point where the generation that, that saw the war is, this has disappeared. There are only about 10,000 or less veterans left after they go. No one, I mean, historians will just talk about what they read on, the, on record. So this is also important as Rico has stated that, that this is uh, to be recorded in permanent form. And Mamari has, has correctly observed that in all the conferences that we participate in, we always talk of incorporating this in the curriculum, but nothing has happened to it. So I, I hope, yeah, we've seen each other in three or four conferences. And we only see, say the same things about this, putting this on, on the curriculum. And I really hope uh, the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office can lead this, uh, this charge. This is a battle. This is really a battle to open up that and to allow maybe one week in the, curric in, in the, in the curriculum on, history, in, on elementary history and, and social studies. Maske one week long of the discussion of the war, you know? uh, or at least a week where they, they remember the war and talk about it through the memories of their grandparents or their parents who, who heard this from their, from their uh, grandparents. So yeah, and, and thank you very much. <laughs> I talked too much, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, you say, Carolina, would you like to add anything? Would you like to say anything, sir? Hello, hello, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Okay, so uh, uh, again, I'd like to thank our uh, uh, institutional partners for uh, you know ma making this happen. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, our speakers, of course, for sharing their uh, knowledge and uh, also my gratitude to our participants. I'd like uh, to share uh, just one information. Uh, last week, the uh, Committee on Higher Education has uh, approved uh, at the committee level House Bill, uh, if I remember the, uh, the number correctly, 5791, which would uh, uh, mandate uh, the teaching of World War II, uh, three units 
No, from uh, K1 to 12 by on, K1 to 12, secondary. And then in higher education, another three units elective. So, so far, that is what we have uh, uh, managed to... Uh, sabi naman niya, no? What, what uh, Chairman De Vera of the uh, uh, commit, uh, Commission on Higher Education uh, committed is that if uh, making it an elective uh, uh, would not uh, give, uh, you know, very good satisfying results in the first, uh, uh, in the pilot years, then uh, they can amend the, uh, the law and make it mandatory. So I think this is a very good uh, start. And uh, hearing from our speakers, I think uh, uh, everybody would like to uh, uh, do this again. In other words, this is worth doing it uh, again. And uh, I hope to uh, uh, see you again and be able to uh, uh, conduct this uh, worthwhile uh, activity once more. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Yes, once again, thank you very much, ma'am and sirs. Now, in recognition of their continuous support, we are also honored to present the Certificate of Appreciation to all the agencies and four of the leading universities in our country that have partnered with us in this noble endeavor. You are one of the key factors that led to the, the, to the success of this activity. Let me read the content of the certificate. Certificate of Appreciation is hereby awarded to these agencies and to the following agencies and institutions. National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Mount Samat F. Tez, Philippine Veterans Bank, the University of the Philippines Department of History, the University of Santo Tomas Department of History, De La Salle University Department of History and Polytechnic University of the Philippines Department of History. And the site number certificate of appreciation, our resource speakers will also be receiving books as tokens from the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. The list of books are as follows. From Pibao, we have Victory at Besang Pass, Filipinos in Korean War, and No One Left Behind Malawi Age Book. From NHTP, we have Honor, The Legacy of Jose Abad Santos. In Performance, Walter Howard Loving and the Philippine Constabulary Band, and General Artemio Ricarte Vibora. Now, apart from these, there is more. Sabi, take it away. Thank you, Felici. Thank you, Felici. In addition to what has been pre presented, both of our partner agencies and universities and our research speakers will be receiving an additional token for the contributions they have made hand in hand with Eva. Let us all watch this. Mm -hmm. Si Mersayan po, ang artist ng Mersayan Design Studio and Merchandise. Kami ay nagmamanufacture ng mga souvenirs na may tema ng World War II at ilang importanteng kasaysayan ng ating bansa. Isa pa ako yung OFW sa Middle East na itatrabaho bilang isang graphic designer sa isang flex of packaging. Ang pangulila ko naging inspirasyon sa mga obra ko at inaga at pininta ko ang labindalawang bayan ng bataan ng Ito ang naging pundasyon ng aking negosyo. Ngayon ay apat na doon na kami nag-ooperate at kasalukuyang meron kami dalawang pwesto. Comics ang una namin produkto. Nilabas ka ang unang comics na may titulong litratista noong taong 2012. Ito ay pinangunahan ng isang fictional na character sa totoong pangyayari. Makalipas sa limang taon, ay nirelease ko naman ang pangalawang comics sa English, Our Mission is to Remember. Dito naman ay puro non-fiction ang istorya at sinulat sa wikang English. At nitong nakaraang taon ay nirelease ko na ang pangatlong comics sa Amusin. Sinabuhay namin ang mga karakter na ito sa paggawa ng dalawang pie na mga pig. 
figures bilang isang chess board set na putang sa pinti. Dahil maraming gustong bumili ito pero dahil nalalaki yan, ay nagpasya kaming gumawa ng mga miniatures version ng 2008. Ang series namin ito ay isa sa mga naging pangunahing produkto namin. Binibenta namin din ito bilang chess board set Bukod sa uh, ikalawang digman ay maroon din kaming series no, pang ng Kastila at tribute para sa mga bayani ng Battle of Mara. Kung kayo naman po ay coin collector, perfect sa inyo ang commemorative coin namin. Bukod sa mga natatanging produktong ito ay mayroon din kaming clothing line. Ito ang pinakamalakas namin na bibenta. Mayroon din kaming karaniwang souvenir tulad ng poster, rep magnet, mugs, keychain at iba pa. Malaki ang naging epekto ng pandemya sa negosyo namin. Dahil sarado pa rin ang ilang tindahan at ibang negosyo ay humina ang aming sales. Sa kabila nito ay nagpapasalamat pa rin ako dahil nakakatanggap pa rin kami ng design projects galing sa mga ibang kliyente na nagpapagawa ng mga challenge coins, badge at mga pin itong mga nakaraang mga lockdown at sa kasalukuyan nagbe-brainstorm kami ng mga bagong produkto at target namin na kapag nakabalik na muli sa normal na pamumuhay ay nakapag-stock na kami ng maraming produkto na aming ibibenta sa so, ngayon ay gumagawa uli kami ng panibagong series ng mga miniatures na aming bibenta sa Bataan at sa ibang parts pa ng Metro Manila Minsan na-impress tayo sa magagandang prasatura ng ibang bayan dahil sa kanilang yaman. Ngunit sa ating mahal at probinsya, ang bentahe natin ay ang natural itong ganda at ang napakayamang kultura at kasaysayan ito. Sa Mersayan, gamit ang sining, pinakita lang namin dito kung paano natin magagamit at mapopromote ang ating yaman. Makita ng mga tao ang halaga ng natural ganda at kasaysayan ng ating bayan. Pinakita lang namin sa Mersayan kung ano ang mga posibilidad na pwede namin magawa sa pamagitan ng ating ligang sining na tayo magpapagmalaki natin dito sa ating probinsya. Patuloy lang natin palakasin at suporta ng mga sining na ito upang makilala rin tayo bilang isang sentro ng arts at ang kasaysayan natin ay yakapin din ng maraming Pilipino. At kami nagpapasalamat po sa lahat ng mga taong sumuporta sa amin, hindi sa mga ahensya ng ating gobyerno, lalo na sa DTI, sa PISEDO, at sa ating mga local government units na wala siyang sumuporta sa ating mga exhibit, art exhibit, trade fairs, seminars. Maraming salamat po sa inyo. Mabuhay po tayo. Watch the beautiful creation of Mr. Mersayan of the Mersayan Design Studio and Merchandise. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to present to you the beautifully sculpted Mersayan miniature soldier resin. Our, our research speakers will be receiving this miniature soldiers, which is 26 centimeters, are part of a collection from 2018 featuring the units involved in the defense of Bataan. They were also hand painted and made out of resin. Philippine Scout and Philippine Army are 46 centimeter tall hand painted sculptures made from resin. It was sculpted by Mersayan from 2020 and to be in Orani Bota. Thank you very much to the people from the Mersayan Design Studio and Merchandises for this very detailed and magnificent creation. Yes, to officially conclude our closing ceremony, may we now have or welcome the chairpersons of the Department of History from some of the leading universities in the country for their special message. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jose Romel B. Hernandez of the De La Salle University, Dr. Archie B. Reses of the University of Santo Tomas, and Professor Marlon F. Agoyagoy, FC, 
of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Sa pagtatapos po ng serye ng ating mga panayam, ibig kong ipaabot sa lahat ang aking taus-pusong pasasalamat sa lahat ng mga naging bahagi nito. Sa mga tagapagsalita, sa mga nagsidalo, at sa lahat ng mga naging katuwang natin sa paglalakbay sa daigdig ng nakaraan, ang daigdig ng kagitingan. Hindi lamang po natin nakita ang higit na malawak na kaligiran ng ating mga kawal. Naipakita rin natin sa mga panayam na ito na anumang tagumpay nating makakamit sa pang-araw-araw na buhay man o maging sa panahon ng digmaan ay isang tagumpay na bahagi ang lahat. Hindi ito naging tagumpay ng isang pangkat lamang ng mga mandirigma kundi ng kagitingan at kabutihan ng isang bansa Sinasabing napagwawagian ang isang digmaan sa pamamagitan ng mga labanan Subalit, higit pa rito ang mga labanang ito ay hindi lamang nagaganap sa malalawak na parang sa mga lungsod, sa dagat o sa himpapawid kundi sa mga munting kagitingang inialay ng bawat isa sa kanyang kapwa Maliwanag ito sa mga kapatiran, katapangan at karangalan sa mga trinchera ng bataan, sa mga patak ng tubig at karampot na pagkaing iniabot sa mga daan patungong O'Donnell, sa mga kabataang buong tapang na nagpatuloy ng labanan, sa mga bayan at lungsod, at sa mga karaniwang taong hindi tumigil sa kanilang pagtulong sa anumang paraan. Sa lahat ng mga yumakap sa kanilang kapwa laban sa malupit na kaaway at sa lahat ng nabuhay sa panganib upang talunin lamang ang mga mananakot. Sa panahong iniukol natin sa pagunita ng mga bagay na ito, sinariwa din natin ang kadakilaan at kagitingan ng ating mga ninuno. Ano pa nga ba ang ating maiaambag sa kanilang kadakilaan kundi ang patuloy na pagtulad natin sa kanilang kagitingan. Isang mapagpalang umaga po sa bawat isa sa atin, binabati ko ang Philippine Veterans Affairs Office sa kanilang matagumpay na ikaunang bahagi ng Pibaw Kagitingan Webinar Series na nagsimula noong Disyembre 2020 sa pamamagitan ng paghahanda at pamamahagi ng mga mahalagang katungkulan sa mga kawani nito ukol sa naging matagumpay na webinar na ito. Inabot ng kalahating taon ang pagsasagawa ng iba't ibang presentasyon ukol sa kahalagahan ng ikalawang digma ang pandeigdigan at ang pakikibaka ng mga Pilipino laban sa mapaniil na dayuhan. Iba't ibang dalubhasa sa mga premyadong pamantasan ang nagbigay ng kanilang karunungan at kaalaman sa pagsasaliksik sa tuluyang uh, pagtulong nito sa maraming sangay ng lipunang Pilipino kasama na ang mga guro at ang mga mag-aaral ng kasaysayan. Nagpapasalamat ang Departamento ng Kasaysayan, Pamantasan ng Santo Tomas, sa pamumuno ng inyong lingkod na kami ay naging bahagi ng makasaysayang webinar na ito. Nakapagbahagi ang pamantasan ng contribution sa ikalalawak ng kaalaman ng mga mamamayang Pilipino ukol sa Yamasita Treasure at gayon na rin sa isyo ng kolaborasyon. Kasama ang iba pang mga pamantasan sa Pilipinas Kinagagalak ng UST na nakapag-abot ng tulong sa pibaw sa mga sumusunod na layunin. Una, ang pagpapalawak ng kaalaman ukol sa kasaysayang pangmilitar at ang kahalagahan ng ikalawang pandaigdigang digmaan. Ikalawa, ipakita ang marubdob na pag-ibig sa tinubuang lupa sa pagpapakita ng kadakilaan ng mga bayaning Pilipino, lalong-lalo na ang mga veterano. Ikatlo, palaganapin ang kaalamang pangkasaysayan, lalo na sa mga kabataan at mag-aaral ng aghampan lipunan. Ikaapat, magkaroon ng matatag na ugnayan sa iba't ibang pamantasan ukol sa paksang tinalakay. Ikalima, palakasin ang pag-aaral ng kasaysayan sa iba't ibang antas ng mag-aaral at huli sa lahat, ikaanim, ang pag-igtingin, ang pagsasaliksik ukol sa kasaysayang pangmilitar 
ng ating bansa. Lahat ng ito ay naging posible sa pamamagitan ng tulong ng bawat isa, lalo't higit ng Philippine Veterans Affairs Office, sa pamumuno ni Undersecretary Ernesto G. Carolina at lahat ng masigasig at masisipag na kawani ng PIBAW. Asahan ninyo na magiging katuwang ang Departamento ng Kasaysayan ng Pamantasan ng Santo Tomas sa mga makabuluhang webinars na katulad nito. Inaasahan namin na maisa sa katuparan ang ikalawang bahagi ng PIBAW kagitingan webinar series sa hinaharap. Isang makasaysayang araw sa ating lahat. On behalf of the Department of History of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, we would like to extend our congratulations to the organizing committee of this webinar series, to the men and women of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office who are responsible for the successful undertaking. Thank you all for making this possible. We promise to continue working with any other educational or historical institutions in educating our people about our past and instilling in them the value of history. Likewise, we would like to thank our participants coming from different institutions all over the Philippines who joined us since day one up to this very moment. The turnout of participants from one webinar to another is overwhelming. In fact, some of them were not able to make it to our Zoom meeting, but still, they were able to witness our webinars via live streaming in the Facebook page of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office. This turnout of participants is a clear indication that we as Filipino people are aware of the importance of our past. No matter what the circumstance is, despite this challenging time, we are still able to educate our people about what had happened before them. Because we believe that it is through learning the lessons of our past that we can be able to plot the proper course of action for the betterment of our nation. With this, we hope to see you all again next time. Thank you very much, sirs. That was a very beautifully made outro. As we are nearing the end of our program, may we now listen to the Secretary of the Department of National Defense, Secretary Benzin and Lorenzana, as he closes today's program. Philippine Veterans Affairs Office Administrator Undersecretary Nesty Carolina, National Historical Commission of the Philippines Chairperson Dr. Rene Escalante, Mount Samat Flagship Tourism Enterprise Zone Administrator Francis Initorio, Philippine Veterans Bank Vice President Miguel Angelo Villarreal, Eminent Historians from the academy and other resource speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Congratulations on our successful Kagitingan webinar series. Despite the pandemic, we were able to supplant our usual commemorative activities with webinars commemorating and highlighting the gallantry of Filipino soldiers in World War II. I am happy to note that the scope of our webinars include the wartime narratives from Manila, Panay, Southern Luzon, Negros, and Cebu, making it truly representative of the history of the nation. Events like this are crucial to boost national pride and bring enlightenment among the Filipino youth. With testaments of bravery, self-sacrifice, and courage, our veterans remind us of our patriotic duties and responsibilities. By providing a broad historical context and the contemporary significance of our webinar topics, 
we have made it clear that we owe our freedom to our veterans and that the succeeding generations must continue this patriotic tradition. Interestingly, our discussions did not shy away from controversial topics such as the Yamashita Treasure and the Makapili. No wonder the turnout was very good. But what I am most happy and proud about is the fact that this was a product of collaboration. In this day and age, it is imperative for us to work together instead of competing. Wala tayong mararating kung tayo ay magkakanya-kanya, mas lalo kung tayo ay magkukompetensya. Pagkakaisa ang susi ng tagumpay. Kaya naman, masaya ako na nagkaisa ang pinakamahuhusay nating mga universidad para sa proyektong ito. In behalf of your One Defense team, let me especially cite the University of the Philippines, the University of Santo Tomas, the La Salle University, and the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, represented by the chairpersons of their respective history departments, namely, Professors Neil Marcial Santillan, Archie Rezos, Jose Romel Hernandez, and Marlon Agoy Agoy. Likewise, I thank our resource speakers who generously shared their time and expertise. Let me also thank and congratulate our partners, the NHCP, TESA, the Philippine Veterans Bank, and AVP Mayor Sayan. Your contributions will inspire our people to live by the values of Kagitingan and be productive citizens for nation building. Finally, I commend Pankat Pibao for this initiative. May you continue to come up with interesting and entertaining ways to educate our people and encourage their interest and participation not only on veterans affairs but affairs of the nation. Maraming salamat. Mabuhay ang Pilipinas. much, Secretary Lorenzana, for your message and your continued support. Just a few reminders before we end, once again, for those who were able to pre-register, we will be sending a link to your email, time to accomplish the evaluation form. You will be receiving your e-certificate after a week. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the Kagitingan, the PIVAO Historical Webinar Series. Maraming salamat sa inyong suporta mula umpisa hanggang dulo. We will be seeing each other again very soon. I am Nico Oreiro. I am Maggie Grace Sahagun. And I am Felicia Lois Lanya. We, we have, have been, been your hosts host for, for this webinar series. series. Once again, this has been your Kagitingan, the PIVAO Historical Webinar Series 2021, officially signing off. Maraming salamat hanggang sa muli.